Now joining us for the uh, regular board meeting portion this evening, um, I'd like to welcome you. Board members and town staff should be available on video for those uh, attending remotely. I'd like to remind board members to mute your microphones when you're not speaking, and please do not use the WebEx chat function. There will be public comments during each ordinance portion, and there will also be the regular public comment period. The regular public comment period um, is limited to three minutes per person. Thank you for joining us, and if you have any issues, please contact Drew Anderson with the Town of Monument. I call to order this regular meeting of the Monument Board of Trustees, Monday, May 3rd, 2021. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Hogan, will you take roll, please? Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Here. Here. Trustee Clark? Here. Trustee Lekind? Here. Trustee Romanello? Here. Trustee Stevens? Here. Trustee Unruh? Here. Okay, before us, we have a consent agenda. Is there any modifications to the agenda? I'd like to make a modification, please. Okay. Can we can we remove um, um, E number E resolution thirty four dash twenty twenty one for individual review? A resolution approving a contract with Ratliff Utilities. Okay. Thank you. Is there any other modifications? Okay. Modify. Uh, is there a motion to approve the agenda as modified? I make a motion to approve the agenda as modified. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Kent. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Ms. Hogan, will you Trustee, take roll, please? Excuse me. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Uh, first item on the agenda ordinance, ordinance number 18 2021, an ordinance approving amendment 4 to Sanctuary Point Phase 1 PD. Ms. Flynn. Good evening, Mayor and Trustee. This is Ordinance 18-2021. Sanctuary Point Phase 1 PD Site Plan Amendment Number 4 and Sanctuary Point Sketch Plan Amendment Number 1. The proposed site is within Phase 1 of Sanctuary Point. The project site is located off a of Sanctuary Rim Drive within Phase 1 of Sanctuary Point. It's 5.11 acres in size. As you can see on your screen, it's the red area. The existing zoning is within phase one of Sanctuary Point. The proposed site is 5.11 acres in size. That was a future site, church site. The church thi diocese no longer has a requirement for a church in this location. Triview Metro District will provide both water and wastewater services for all development within Sanctuary Point. The existing surrounding uses include phase one of Sanctuary Point to the north and west. Baptist Road to the south and Fox Run Regional Park to the east. The applicant requests for number one is amendment to the Sanctuary Point sketch plan to increase the density of capacity from 600 lots to 612 lots. 
The additional 12 lots matches the density adjacent to the site, which is two to three dwelling units per acre, which equates to 11 to 16 lots. Applicant request number two, amendment to the approved sanctuary point phase one, preliminary final PD site plan to replace the proposed church site with 12 residential lots. Increasing the total lots to 267 single family residential lots on 141.907 acres. A traffic impact and access analysis was conducted by LS, LSC transportation consultants on February 19th, 2021. Sanctuary Rim Baptist Roads level service is D or better during the peak hours as a two way stop controlled intersection. The site access with Sanctuary Rim Drive is level of service B or better. The vehicle queue length will not exceed two vehicles, which is 50 feet in length for any of the turn movements at this study intersections. This indicates that there will not be an issue with the queue at the Sanctuary Rim Baptist intersection, extending to impact the proposed site access intersection on Sanctuary Rim Drive. The 12 residential lots will generate 148 new vehicle trips on an average weekday. During the morning peak hour from 6.30 to 8.30 a.m., three vehicles will enter the site and 10 vehicles will exit the site. During the afternoon peak hour from 4.15 to 6.15, eight vehicles will enter the site and five vehicles will exit the site. There was a public process for this site. A virtual neighborhood meeting was conducted on January 20th, 2021 with, the ta with town residents who lived 500 feet radius at the project site. The, at this virtual neighborhood meeting, 15 lots were showed at this original project. A follow up meeting was held on February 11th, 2021 at Classic Homes with residents who lived adjacent to the site. After this meeting with Classic, the applicant removed one lot on the west side. Lots one through four have been spread out to reduce the number of lots adjacent to the boundary. The size of lots four through seven is adjusted to match the adjacent lots more closely. An additional trail connection was added between lots eight and nine as requested to provide continued access to the proposed county regional trail and trail cover under Baptist Road to Fox Run Park, as well as a trail connection between lots four and five. A note was added to the plan to grant restrict lots one through eight and lot 12. On April 14th, 2021, at the Planning Commission hearing, 10 members from the public had questions and concerns. These concerns were about the number of trees due to the Firewise Code, the lot size compared to adjacent lots, the number of lots, traffic safety, property values, if the neighborhood could purchase the property. Planning Commission voted four to one to recommend approval. The Planning Commission recommends approval of Ordinance 18-2021 Sanctuary Point Phase 1 PD Site Plan Amendment Number 4 and Sanctuary Point Sketch Plan Amendment Number 1 based on the staff report findings that the proposed development complies with all standards and criteria for approval. Next, Andrea Barlow with NES will be presenting. Let me just put up her presentation. Good evening, trustees. Andrew Barlow with NES on behalf of Classic Homes, um, presenting uh, the case for the applicant. Just wait for my presentation to come up and I don't have the clicker, so I'll be asking Debbie to forward the slides. Hear me? Is it even on? Is it on? Okay. Drew, I, I might need your help. I'm sorry about the delay. We are ready to go. Next slide. 
as Debbie indicated, we have two, two requests, one for uh, amendment to the sketch plan to increase the density cap by 12 units and one to uh, lay out the former church site for 12 residential units uh, to increase to 267. Next slide. We did have a neighborhood meeting as, as Debbie indicated on January the 20th, quite a few number of people were involved in that virtual meeting. And then we had a follow up meeting with a smaller group on the 11th of February. The primary concerns that were expressed by the neighbors were um, that they were told that during their house purchase that there would be eight to 10 units on the pro property that there would uh, perceived impact on the entrance to sanctuary point with loss of trees. A uh, potential loss of trail access and removal of the trail um, on the sewer easement, which is along the northern boundary of the property. Um, they were concerned about the lot sizes not being compatible with adjacent lot sizes and the perception that the proposed density is not compatible and concerns about traffic and the proximity of the access to Sanctuary Rim Drive. So I'm going to address all of those through my presentation. So next slide. So as as was noted, when we first submitted this um, application, we were proposing 15 lots of a single cul-de-sac as shown. So um, at the neighborhood meeting, there were certain things that became very apparent from the neighbors' concerns was primarily the concern about the loss of the trees and the loss of the entrance feel at Sanctuary Point. So at that meeting, the developer suggested uh, removing the first two lots on that uh, cul-de-sac, lots one and 15, in order to retrain, re retain some trees at that entrance. And it, with that was hoping that that would garner the neighbor's support. There was certainly some uh, feedback at that meeting and we received correspondence after the meeting from neighbors who did say, that they would support um, the project if that um, change was made. But then subsequent uh, discussions with some of the other neighbors indicated that that wasn't a unanimous support across the board. So with that, we had an additional meeting. Next slide. Which was on uh, February the 11th, at which point we presented our revised plan to remove lots 1 and 15. So we reduced the number of lots to 13. And in doing so, one of the other concerns, as I'd noted, is that there is a trail, uh, a sewer easement along the back of uh, lots one through five where there is a trail. And the neighbors were concerned about the loss of that trail and their ability to access the play area, which is on Sanctuary Rim Drive, and also to access the um, county trail um, along Baptist Road, which gives also access to Fox Run Regional Park. So we included as you can see on here between lots five and six, a trail connection to bring them down to the cul-de-sac so that then they could gain access to these areas via the, um, the uh, regular sidewalks within the cul-de-sac. All the way through this, the lot sizes have um, remained generally the same. The previous lot size average was about 11,000. With this change, it came down to just under 11,000. And if we go to the next slide, we can see that there was an increase in the lot size with this final change that we, we made. And this was really to um, address some of the concerns we heard at the February 11th meeting. So the, uh, the remaining concerns we heard, and I'm not saying this was, was across the board, but the ones that we felt we could address were um, we removed an additional lot along the northern boundary. So the lots one, two, four, were spread out and uh, a lot was re removed in that area. One of the concerns, particularly of the residents of uh, lot four on the adjacent filing on the end of the cul-de-sac was that they would be looking at three lots now um, to their one lot. So we, we spread that out so that the, they were backing onto just the two lots. And then we created uh, one of the other concerns was that there still wasn't really the straight shot that they have uh, to get to the regional trail. So we created an additional um, trail track between lots eight and nine to provide that, that continual access from the cul-de-sac in the north there, which is called clandestine court, um, to come through between lots four and five and then through eight and nine to access the regional trail. And then in addition, we agreed to uh, ranch restrict, which means restricting it to a single story building, which is going to be about 28 
feet high, but general ranch height. So all lots one through eight and lot 12 on the corner would be restricted to single, single story buildings, ranch buildings. So they were the compromises we, we made, which we felt had addressed primarily all the, the, the primary concerns that we heard from the neighbors. Um, we submitted that uh, plan to the neighbors and they still expressed concern and they wanted to see lots one and th to three redivided into two lots and they wanted to see additional changes uh, to the, they wanted to retain the trail uh, along the back there of lots one through four and then lot six, which is, which was reduced slightly in size to even out the lot sizes in that area. They wanted to see increased. So at that point, we felt we had made sufficient uh, concessions to the neighbors requests and felt that we had addressed their primary concerns. And so we, we didn't agree to these final changes and um, that's why we are with you um, uh, presenting this proposal for 12 lots. Next slide. So that was really the background to how we got to where we are with this, with the plan we are submitting. Next slide. I just want to put it in context of what's already been approved. So this is the approved sketch plan from 2006. You can see the church right there in purple. And then the adjacent area is the uh, 2.3 dwelling units per acre in that kind of uh, buff color. So the area immediately to the north and west of the church site was 2.3 units per acre, as is the area immediately to the south on the other side of Sanctuary Rim Drive. So at that point, we have um, 600 units across the entirety of the 460 acres with an overall density of 1.3. Next slide. slide. So the change we have made is to make that density a, um, the same as the adjacent density areas. So again, in that two, two to three units per acre, so exactly the same density classification as the areas around it. The resulting impact of increasing to 612 units across the 460 acres is an increase from 1.3 to 1.33 units per acre. So barely a perceptible change in the density of the overall sanctuary point development. Next slide. Now, looking at the, um, the, the more detailed development, we have our phases one, two, and three. And phase one was always intended to be the higher density portion of the site. Uh, as we went through our, sing, uh, our sketch plan process, um, and some of you may be uh, uh, recalled some of the discussions when we went through the more recent phase two and phase three site plans, is that we, were, we had to make concessions all the way around for the neighbors adjacent to this overall sanctuary point development um, in, uh, in the county. So we have the Higby Estates neighbors to the north, we have the Kingswood neighbors and Fox Run neighbors to the south. So there were um, requirements through the sketch plan to have larger lots on those perimeter areas, um, to have a buffer on those perimeter areas, to limit the size of some of those lots to 20,000 square feet on, on that southern portion. And uh, so all, all, as a result of that, the higher density portion of Sanctuary Point has always been the phase one area. So that's at about an average of 1.8 units per acre. Phase two goes down to 1.4 and then phase three, um, partly due to topography as well, um, is down to 0.6 to give you that overall 1.3. Next slide. And then just looking at the phase one area, so 142 acres, 250 units as currently approved, you can see phase C there has actually a slightly higher density area in the center um, of that phase C area and um, the 1.8 units per acre. Next slide. If we add in the church site as we are currently showing it with the 12 units, we um, increased from uh, 255 units to 267 units, increasing a, a density from 1.8 to 1.88 across the entirety of that phase one area. So still a very minor increase in the overall density of the project, bringing in the five acres and adding the 12 units. So still in that, well within that um, uh, similar range of 1.8. 
Um, existing densities, looking in a little bit more in detail of the surrounding uh, pockets of development, so to speak, rather than that broader two to three units per acre. Um, we have had a lot of discussion with the neighbours about the comparability of the density. So phase A, um, that northern part of phase A that was in the um, uh, two to three units per acre density range on the sketch plan. So that's the area kind of um, within the sanctuary south of Sanctuary Rim Drive. We gave all our um, different classifications of residential lots a, a, a number. So th this is PRD4, which basically sets the lot sizes, minimum lot sizes, the setbacks, the heights, and so on. So it's your zoning standards. So that phase A area is 1.9 units per acre, and that's a PRD4. The phase B1, um, we split phases phase B into phase B1 for the existing phase B2 for our proposed. That is also in the PRD4 category, and that's at 2.2 units per acre. Phase C, which is a different category altogether of, of they're attached to residential, they go into a higher density category of 3.3. Uh, so they're the existing densities that are surrounding this uh, pocket of development that we're proposing. And then within this Phase B2, it is also PRD4, so exactly the same as phase B1 and phase A in terms of the development standards, minimum lot size, and so on. And that's a density of 2.35 units per acre. So that's very comparable, particularly to the B1 area, very similar density, well within that range of two to three units per acre as allowed on the sketch plan. So just Going on to the next slide, just to talk a little bit more about what that residential category P, PRD4 indicates. Um, so there will be a minimum lot size of 8,000 square feet. The setbacks for the front and rear will be 20 feet side setbacks of five feet. So the same as the surrounding lots, the, cat the category is the same, maximum building height of 35 feet. However, I will note again that we have voluntarily ranch restricted lots one through eight and lot 12. So they will not be anywhere near that 35 foot um, height maximum. We've also retained the 50 foot buffer along uh, Sanctuary, uh, sorry, along Baptist Road, which is consistent along the entirety of the Baptist Road frontage for Sanctuary Point. And then forest management areas, sorry, I should have changed this. I noticed this last time. It's really at the back of six, lot six, seven, and a little bit of eight. You can see that kind of, uh, line area, which is where we, um, on, on the other filings in phase one, we identified areas of lots where we could retain existing trees. And that's the area we have identified for this parcel. And we may well be able to expand that if we go on to the next cap, uh, slide. This shows uh, the limits of the kind of the grading, the uh, grading for the street. And there will be areas at the back of these lots, especially six, seven, and eight, and um, 12 and 11, possibly as well, um, where we could retain more trees. Uh, grading limits um, have we, we reduced those from our original submittal to make sure that we could reduce the impact on trees as much as possible. At this point, I will touch on one of the comments that was made at the um, uh, planning commission meeting about the firewise impact on trees. So, because Sanctuary Point is a firewise community, there are specific restrictions in place as to how close uh, trees can be to the homes. And so, there, there is a need for some tree removal, and there was some concern that with the proximity of the, the, the lots here, whether it would cause the adjacent lots to actually have to remove any other trees. As noted before, these will have a 20 foot setback. So there will not be any uh, impact on the, on the trees on the adjacent lots as a result of the homes going onto these lots. They won't be in close enough proximity. Next slide. I'm going to talk a bit about traffic. Um, Debbie covered this in, in, in some detail, um, but I'm just going to look at it in a more broad context in that um, the original master traffic study that's for Sanctuary Point back in the mid 2000s actually assumed a church site and that assumed a church site of 65,000 square feet. So a fairly sub substantial church, which would 
involve the entire overlock grading of that property and the removal of trees and any any natural terrain on that on that five acre property as a result of the church development. It also the traffic study also assumed 650 units, which is in excess of what where we are today with our proposal of 612. Um, so the 12 homes will add approximately 3% additional trips to Sanctuary Point. Um, the daily trips will um, in, at Baptist Road and Sanctuary Rim will increase by about 6%. And then to put that in context in terms of the traffic that the, the neighbours may be experiencing now, approximately 8.5% of the trips currently are on the roads there are related to construction. So the increase from this development will actually be less than the ultimate decrease in construction traffic. Uh, the 12 homes will add a lot, lot, lot less traffic than uh, the previously proposed church site. So uh, next slide, we can look at that in a little detail. The, um, the church site would, on a weekday, would generate approximately 304 um, additional trips per day than the 12 lots. And at the weekend, on a Sunday, when the majority of the services take place, it's uh, almost 1,700 additional trips that the church site would have generated compared to these 12 lots. Next slide. There's some ex, uh, concerns were expressed about the proximity of the access to um, Sanctuary Rim and Baptist Road. There is 325 feet, which is adequate for uh, safe spacing of accesses. And it's important to understand that because of the nature of the Baptist and Sanctuary Rim intersection, it's a T intersection. So anybody turning into the property, whether they're turning left into the property off Baptist or right, will be slowing down to do so. It's not as though it were a four way intersection where people could be speeding straight across the intersection at a traffic signal, for example. There's the, the entry feature. If you're not familiar with that, it's like a, it's an island with the entry sign there and it creates a deflection. Uh, that slows people down as well. So when they're coming into the site, there will be uh, coming in at slower speeds due to that traffic calming measure as well. Uh, the need for a right turn uh, off a collector is triggered by 50 right turns in an hour. The, the traffic at this new intersection will be a man maximum of 10 right turns in an hour, and that will be at the peak times. So there's nothing there that requires um, additional traffic measures that suggest that would there will be any concerns regarding safety. Uh, there were comments made at the planning commission meeting about the safety for children utilizing the play area, which is a little further north on um, Sanctuary Rim Drive, but the majority per the traffic study, and I think logic would suggest this, the majority of traffic from this cul-de-sac will be going onto Baptist Road to get access to Baptist rather than driving uh, west on Sanctuary Rim Drive. Not to say that none will, but the majority will be going on to Baptist Road. Next slide. I want to talk a bit about the comprehensive plan. Again, there were some suggestions, not so much at the Planning Commission hearing, but through the discussions with the neighbours, that this uh, project that we're proposing is not consistent with the comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan shows just the, on the existing land use plans, shows the very um, uh, eastern portion of Sanctuary Rim based on what was developed at that time as lower density development with the remainder of it vacant. So um, pretty much all the single family detached residential and monument falls within this um, lower density residential category on this existing land use plan. So that would include Promontory Point, Point Jackson Creek, British Centre, Trails End, Lake of the Rockies, and, and others. And um, that they have a range of lot sizes, and they range from as low as 4,800 up to 12,000 or, or more, some, with some larger pie-shaped lots on the cul-de-sacs. In Sanctuary, Rim, uh, Sanctuary Point, we've got a, an equally wide range of um, lot sizes from 3,800 all the way up to almost three acres. Um, the current phase ranges from 6,000 to 52,000, and the proposed phase B2 is 8,400 to 5,200. So we're fairly consistent with the overall category of range of um, 
lot sizes that are in that lower density residential category on the comprehensive plan. So we feel that we're entirely consistent with that comprehensive plan. If we go to the next slide, the future land use map shows uh, the whole of Sanctuary Rim, except for the kind of the green corridors that we've saved as, as public uh, open space areas um, as single family detached residential. And here are some of the attributes and characteristics that the comprehensive plan identifies. And I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll just highlight a couple. It says a mix of compatibly designed single family detached houses, smaller lot sizes where, it's, where clustering can help to maintain open spaces. And that's exactly what we've done in Sanctuary Point. There's large areas of open space have been retained. Um, designed uh, to allow transitions between existing larger lots and homes and smaller lots. So we incorporated those transitions throughout Sanctuary Point with the adjacent um, uh, county lots. And then the setbacks and what have you are, are just basically typical of a single family home that they allow enough usable space between lots. So pretty consistent with the standards, uh, single family detached zoning and land use. Next slide. So I'm going to go through um, the PD site plan review criteria in, in a little detail because I think it's important to understand that these are the criteria against which this project needs to be assessed. So the first thing is, does it conform or consistent with the preliminary plan where we are obviously revising the preliminary plan to uh, match what we're proposing, but it is uh, consistent in terms of the density, generally in terms of what's already approved for phase one. So we believe that it conforms to the existing preliminary plan for the site. The relationship with the surrounding area, this is one of the matters that the, the neighbours are particularly concerned about. But as I've noted, the, um, the project is within the same density category as shown on the sketch plan. Um, and it is within the same uh, lots standards that are applied on the phase one PD site plan in that PRD4 and the density is similar and uh, close to what's on the adjacent properties. So the adjacent areas are similar density. So internal street circulation is that adequate basically and um, we're going to have a single cul-de-sac which is meet, meets town's requirements, meets town standards access directly off Sanctuary Rim Drive, it has safe access there. And then sidewalks and the trail access tracks are provided to ensure connectivity to existing trails and sidewalks. Functional parks, open space and trails are provided. This applies more to the entirety of Sanctuary Point. Um, they, those are provided and within this development, we're providing connectivity to those. A variety of development and housing types and styles and densities are proposed mixed land use is encouraged. So across the entirety of Sanctuary Point, I think as I, I, point, I, I noted in an earlier slide, has a wide range of uh, lot sizes, a diversity of housing in terms of cost and, and uh, type in all in one location. So it definitely meets that objective of the PD site plan review criteria. Privacy for individuals, families and neighbors. Uh, the lot sizes are similar to those on the adjacent um, uh, filings. They are um, uh, meeting the same setback requirements, heights, as, as previously noted, some of those, the majority of them are being uh, restricted to ranch units. And so we believe that they are providing adequate privacy for both existing and future residents. The adequacy and safety of the access points, I've discussed that. And um, we will also be, like I say, be ensuring that we have trail connections to the County Regional Trail and Fox Run Regional Park. The building type in terms of appropriate to density, site relationship and bulk. Well, we, we are proposing single family detached homes, which are either one story or two story, that are going to be similar, if uh, very similar to the adjacent properties. They're going to be built by the same builders. They are going to be uh, meeting the same lot standards. So that is going to be consistent. Building design, um, th there are very specific lot design guidelines for Sanctuary Point, which apply to this, which will apply to these 12 lots, just as it applies to the adjacent lots. Same with landscape design standards. Adequate off street parking, they'll all have two, at least two car garages, if, if not more, and driveway parking spaces, the same as the adjacent neighbors. 
and the plan fits within the context of land use patterns. The additional traffic and utility of demands for these 12 lots are not going to be materially um, different than the entirety of Sanctuary Point, so it will be accommodated within the surrounding roads and utility systems. And as previously noted, the 12 lots single family uh, residential use will be significantly less traffic than the original proposed church use. And next slide, and I just want to pause before I, I go on to um, the next, uh, the questions and reiterate my comment before, if you look at this aerial photograph, um, if this were to have been developed for a church, a 65,000 square foot church, there would not be a tree remaining on that parcel as originally planned. It would be completely uh, overlock graded, so any natural terrain would have been removed and probably also unlikely that the church would have wanted a trail connection going right through their property that uh, could possibly have been achieved on the perimeter, but it would have looked very different. Um, another point I wanted to make is that there has been some suggestion by neighbours um, that we are in some way manipulating the plans to give false information about lot sizes. So the lot sizes that are on the 12 lot proposed subdivision are accurate based on the design of the subdivision. We also designed the adjacent filings and they reflect the lots that have been approved on the preliminary PD site plan and have been that the lot sizes that have been platted. So I just wanted to make that point quite clearly. There has been no manipulation of any lot sizes, setbacks or anything. They simply reflect the standards that are being proposed by the PRD for zoning category on the phase one site plan. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions from the board before we open up the public hearing portion. Uh, what for Ms. Barlow or Ms. Flynn. What's the smallest lot size in phase B1? 8,400. And our smallest one is, uh, they're generally 8,400, but we've got one at 8,351. And that's mainly because that corner is kind of cut off there because of the cul-de-sac. Um, tell me about the, the, the trails and connections again that you're describing, you, you did a lot, you did it fast, you, 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 which I know you had to, but so, is there the trail maintained along that easement? No, yes so or the no? trail the trail along that easement will be removed and it will be replaced with a trail connection between lots four and five to the cul-de-sac. And then across the cul-de-sac, there is another trail connection between lots eight and nine. Going towards going the park, towards that culvert um, underneath Baptist. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for the board from the board at this time before we open it up to public hearing? Okay, this is a public hearing item, so I will open up the public hearing portion. Um, at this time, is there anyone who would like to speak against this ordinance? Ma'am? It's not working. Um, my name is Patricia Cremens. I live at 1775 Lazy Cat Lane. It's the fourth lot on Lazy Cat Lane that backs directly to this new development. We have an 18,000 square foot lot. Thank you. Um, and according to the plans, they're building not two lots in our backyard, but three lots. If you look at the plan again closely, we will have three new homes in our backyard and no trail as a buffer between our homes. There's currently a trail there that was built by Classic Homes last summer. That is a nice trail. They brought in, they brought in equipment to make that trail. They brought in rocks and grass, and that's a beautiful trail that goes to the park, which is being eliminated from the backyard. 
So, and I don't agree that the lot sizes are equal to the adjacent lots because all of our lot sizes, except for one, are at least 17 to 18 to 21,000 square foot lots. So these are much smaller lots than the adjacent ones to us. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sarah Permanek. I live at 16406 Clandestine Court, um, which is also adjacent to the new proposal. Um, first, I wanna say thank you for allowing us to uh, give you feedback on this matter. Uh, we moved here like many of the others so that we could have a small town feel, be in the trees. Um, otherwise, we would have probably moved out east to Banning Lewis, but nope, we wanted the trees. So. We began our process with Saddle Train 2018. Uh, we were told that there would be approximately eight to 10 homes built, uh, as were all of our neighbors. And when we moved into our home in 2020, uh, that's when Classic put in a formal trail at the top of our cul-de-sac down to our mailboxes. Uh, that's the trail that we keep referring to. You can see there's a line at the edge from the cul-de-sac down. Um, we have a lot of kids in the neighborhood. This is the trail that we use to get down to the play area um, safely so that we're not going near uh, any of the streets and to get down to our mailboxes. The other playground that's being put in is far enough away that we would actually have to drive over to it unless we're taking my one-year-old and five-year-old um, you know, over to Fox Run Park, which we do, but to get all the way over would, would be quite a hike. And so um, really what we are asking for is that um, the promise that we were told really eight to 10 homes that that would be kept. Uh, we did bring that up with classic. Um, I do have emails that I brought with us uh, today where we had, we were told um, in writing, there'd be eight to 10 homes. We also have requests from all the neighbors to keep kind of the eight to 10 home uh, number, which is what we were, uh, what we all thought we were getting into when we bought those homes adjacent to this parcel. Um, I have to say Classic has worked with us. They did reduce it to 12 and ranch restrict, and we are grateful for that. Um, but taking away the, the trail and uh, having us walk on the sidewalk is a completely different feel. Um, again, also not having that trail as a buffer to the new homes uh, is, is also um, tricky. Additionally, uh, during the planning commission, uh, it was brought up that it's 5.11 acres and that the density should be around 2, point, uh, two to three lots per acre. Uh, which would make the minimum 10.22. Um, and at the planning commission, uh, they said that they couldn't go lower than the 12. And so um, that was something, just a little interesting thing on the math there. Um, and additionally, if they were to keep the same density, which is that 1.8 uh, uh, units uh, per acre, that would look more like 9.19 homes roughly, as opposed to 12. So uh, just commenting that, that there was something there that wanted to kind of take a look at. Um, also, in this new area, Classic is the only one building. As I mentioned, we built with Saddle Tree. Other friends built with Vanguard. Uh, they will not be providing homes in this area. It will only be Classic building. Um, so that is a little different than the rest of the neighborhood. So really, we're requesting that Classic uh, maintain our trail down to our mailboxes, that uh, we reduce the homes so we can retain more of the trees if possible, uh, so that we can retain that uh, small town feel and really the, the feel of the trees that we all came here for. So thank you so much. Thank you. Who else would like to speak against this item? Hi, my name is Beth Relaford, and I hate public speaking, but this is important to me, so I'm here <laughs> doing this. So in May of 2017, prior to signing a contract to build our current home, we inquired with our builder, Vantage Homes, the plan usage and access point for the parcel of land adjacent to our lot. And we are in uh, lot number 19, which is uh, right, um, I can't see from here, but <laughs> can you come right behind six? So six will be a flag lot um, on the new area as well. And that means that the home will have to be, it will have a long driveway in and will be set back closer to our home with the five foot setbacks on each side. Their side yard will be 
our side yard. So there will be like five feet between our house to our fence and five feet from that house and that fence, which would eliminate all those trees. Um, our understanding was this, this parcel was originally zoned as a church, but that classic would eventually develop it into single family homes accessed from Sanctuary Rim Drive. After Vantage inquired with Classic, they were informed the total number of homes to be built would be eight or nine homes and access would come from Sanctuary Rim. And I have a copy of the email from Vantage stating that. We have since come to learn that a similar expectation around the number of homes to be built was communicated to our neighbors by all three builders, including Classic Homes. We understand that Classic owns this parcel and has stated their intent and right to develop it. Our concern is not with them proceeding, but with the number of proposed homes and smaller lot widths as those directly adjacent on clandestine court and Lazy Cat Lane. All of the homes on clandestine court and Lazy Cat Lane have at least three car garages. This will not be possible with the proposed lot widths for all of those lots. While Classic adapted their plan to address their initial intent to remove existing trails and amended their original planned 15 lots, talk stalled after Classic started to make threatening remarks that they would just proceed anyways, could stack the approved dwellings only along the adjoining neighbor's properties, increasing perceived density on adjacent lots, or convince a church to purchase the lot and build a massive structure since it is currently zoned for that. Frankly, this felt like a scare tactic to force in their proposal without listening to the concerns of the existing residents. In closing, we support Classic developing eight or nine homes of equal lot widths as those directly adjacent to this property. This is in line with the stated purpose and number of structures when we completed our due diligence and signed a contract to build in Sanctuary Point versus what currently is perceived by myself and fellow neighbors as a classic bait and switch tactic by the developer. We love living in Monument and hope that the Board of Trustees will hold this business accountable to expectations which were set to us and our neighbors years before they even had formal approval to do so. That's all I have. Thank you. Would anybody else like to speak against? Ma'am? My name is Christy Musser and I live at 1734 Lazy Cat Lane. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, the adjacent cul-de-sacs. And I believe Andrea, I think Mrs. Barlow is talking about me. Um, I don't think that they were trying to be misleading, but I'd like to get out the actual numbers and facts to you about the lots on the adjacent lots. So, um, clandestine court, which is the cul-de-sac north of this cul-de-sac, has 10 homes with the smallest lot size being 8,750 square feet. And the width of that lot is 80 feet. That's very important. So they can put a three car garage. They have a lot of space in between the homes next to them. Um, the next smallest lot being 10,633 feet. Every single house on that street has three car garages. Um, Lazy Cat Lane, my cul-de-sac has nine homes. The smallest lot size being 11,688, which is mine. Um, and then the next size up after that is 12,718, all the way up to um, 21,000 square feet. And all of the lots are at least 70 feet wide and they all do have three car garages. Catnap Lane, which is the very last adjacent lot up on the top half has 17 homes. Four of those homes have lots that are exactly 8,400 square feet. And all of those lots are 70 feet wide. It's very important to notice this because they all have three car garages, they're 70 feet wide. So while the cul-de-sac lots on the proposed lots, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight are relatively the same size as the smallest lots um, on all of these um, lots, nine, 10, 11, and 12 are only 60 feet wide and therefore can only even have a two car garage. They're very stacked on top of each other. It's kind of like saying, 
hey, I have a square and it's 8,400 square feet, but I also have, I, then I have a rectangle and it's 8,400 square feet. They're very much different. So in saying that the adjacent cul-de-sacs are similar, it's very deceiving. And that's what I meant when I spoke to the planning commission last time. And I didn't have a good, get a chance to um, speak after the rebuttal in that, but now I have the facts and the data and those lots are not similar to any of the coldest the the, the lots um, the appearance when you come southwest up um, baptist where phase a is um, the smallest lot size over there is 11,635 square feet all the way up to 14,000 square feet also three car garage um, widths 70 plus um, the widths are 70 plus so when you're driving up baptist road you can see some of the houses in the trees. They're very far spread apart. The width of the lots is very important, not just the setback and the size of the lot. So then, and you can see in the picture, then you come into the sanctuary rim, you're making a left-hand turn, and there's gonna be house stacked, 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 stacked. The width matters. So in reducing that to the nine or 10 homes, like we've been promised, um, it would give that exact same feel as phase A, as my cul-de-sac, as clandestine court, and also is cat nap lane. Um, so that's just basically one that, what I wanted to point out. And per the PD site plan review criteria number six and eight, that the adjacent that they match the adjacent lots, I feel like it does not meet the site plan review criteria on, on number eight. They um, it does not. I do believe that lots one through you know, eight are similar in size a little bit, but again, one, two, three, and four, and lots nine, ten, eleven, and twelve, the width is therefore is so small that um, the appearance is not going to look anything like the adjacent lots. So that's all I have to say. I just hope you guys consider, um, you know, we're all for new families and new homes and we welcome this new cul-de-sac, but we want it to be, you know, conducive and, and looking like our homes that we spent a lot of money on. So. Thank you. Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody uh, remotely that would like to speak against this item? I'll... Mr. Anderson? Okay, then we'll go ahead with our in-person and then we'll go back to that one. Go ahead, ma'am. Good evening, trustees. Uh, my name is Lisa Macedo, and I live at 1785 Catnap Lane. So a lot of this talk tonight is about numbers and calculations and lot sizes, but at the end of the day, we're just people. And so I want to talk about the people living in Sanctuary Point. When we asked our neighbors what they were told about the entrance, they were really upset. We've received hundreds of letters and statements. Most had no idea that the entrance area was even slated to be built on. They thought that the area was finished with the trails and landscaping and bell tower, and they were dismayed at the idea that the entrance trees that make our neighborhood a sanctuary could be removed. They expressed frustration and anger at being caught in a bait and switch. One neighbor who moved in this year was told by their builder that a perk of buying at the entrance was that the area was already built on and finished. And wouldn't they want that compared to moving into lower sanctuary point where construction was taking place and that person bought with classic. Other neighbors had asked if the land at the entrance would be built on when they purchased their homes. Very few knew of the church plan since this had already fallen through. They were consistently told eight to 10 homes by all three builders. We know this range isn't some magic number pulled out from the air. It's obvious where the sales teams for the three builders got this number. They only had to look at the adjacent court, Lazy Cat Lane, which is roughly the same square footage and see that it has nine homes on it. At the planning commission meeting last month, NES claimed that only Vantage and Saddle Tree sales reps had told residents that eight to 10 homes would be built at the entrance area. And this is not true. Our neighbors were verbally told by sale reps at Vantage, Saddle Tree, and Classic. And one neighbor even has notes on a sales map from Classic that states eight to 10 homes. This is not an issue of misinformation. This is an issue of establishing an area density and then trying to cram a few more on the top. The sales teams looked at the resources that they were given, the density data, excuse me, the density data for adjacent Lazy Cat Lane with similar area footage and made an educated guess. 
In our meetings with Classic and NES, we have been consistently told that it didn't matter what the sales teams had told us because the planning commissioners wouldn't care, that you wouldn't care, that it wasn't something that could be taken into consideration. But again, this is about people. This is about the residents and taxpayers of Monument. So tonight we've heard a lot of narrative of how reasonable and accommodating Classic and NES have been. And I want to offer you a different narrative. And this is a narrative of the people. We, the residents of Monument, have been bullied throughout this entire process. The first threat came at the neighborhood meeting in January when we were told that Classic would only take two proposed lots off the plan if we would say right then that they had our total support. Otherwise, they would continue with their proposal for 15. At the meeting at Classic headquarters, the Classic rep told my neighbor that if we continue to fight the issue and they were able to limit their ability to build the proposed number of lots, they would build eight homes all squished together along her fence line. At the same meeting, we were told that if we wouldn't support their new plan, they would clear cut all of the trees. So at the end of the day, we were just people or just neighbors trying to support each other and the dream that we were sold on. And this dream for us was called Sanctuary Point. So I urge you trustees to protect your monument residents. I want to tell people that monument is a good place to build and to build and to buy in. And that the city of monument watches out for its residents first before the interests of a big builder. That the trees and green space we love will be here tomorrow. So please vote no on this proposal. Thank you. Mr. Anderson will take our online comment. Will you repeat that last name? Okay. Ms. Whiteside, would you like to comment on this uh, ordinance? Yeah, I would like to. This is Glenn Whiteside, uh, Glenn and Monica Whiteside. We're at 16465 Clandestine Court. And I would just like to say to vote no against this. It, it really needs to be like eight homes. It, it's going to take too many trees out. They're going to they're stacking lots 12 through 8 right along Baptist. To me, that's going to be an eyesore when you're stacking those lots so close right along Baptist and it'll ruin the whole the whole look of the entryway to the to the sanctuary point. Right now it's beautiful and I think this will just be a terrible um, addition and, and the loss of trees is is just too much. For uh, for 12 homes, so I I'm urging you to please vote against this. Mm -hmm. It's not in the best interest of of the neighborhood and and the people here in Monument. Thank you very much. Thank you. If we have no other comments against, we will go to comments for this item. Do we have any comments for comments for this item, Mr. Anderson? Do we have any comments? For any additional comments online? Okay. At this point, I will close the public hearing portion um, and give the uh, applicant an opportunity to rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Could we go back to an earlier slide? Um, keep going. Stop. That one, yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the suggestion that, uh, that, that a few things about the compatibility of the lots, first of all. I mean, obviously, I've addressed this in my presentation, but I just want to pick up on some of the specific comments that were made. So uh, Ms. Mrs. Clemens, who lives on 1750 Lazy Clap, I think it's 1750 Lazy Cat Lane, um, lot number four on Lazy Cat Lane that you can see adjacent to the northern boundary, northwestern boundary. There are there were originally um, three lots. It, actually, if you can go back a couple more slides. To the uh, 15, 15 site plan one. Yeah, so uh, against um, that uh, lot number four, there are originally basically two lots two and three fully uh, along that boundary. Lot four almost uh, over half, and then a fraction of lot one. So you had about 
three lots equivalent uh, along that boundary. Uh, when we went to uh, the, re the revised, uh, sorry, I'm looking at the 13. Sorry, lots um, three and four, a little of two and five. If you go on to the next one, it was lots two and three fully there with a little of one and four. And so we expanded those lots. To, so it was really just two and three and then a, a small area of lot one. So it's really not three lots. We've, we've adjusted it so it would be more comparable with just the two lots behind the single uh, lot number four. Um, I just wanted to clarify that point. Uh, regarding the um, small town feel, we we think this is is going to be just similar lots to what's already in the rest of Sanctuary Sanctuary Point. It is going to maintain the character of Sanctuary Point. Classic is not going to do anything to deteriorate the character of the development that it has striven very hard to create uh, a project that retains trees, that has lots that can retain trees on the site and that um, includes uh, the trail connections we have proposed to replace um, the trail at the back of lots one through uh, four. We have tried to address all the neighbors comments and to the point about uh, the eight to nine homes and the the threat or, or the suggestion that um, we said you wouldn't care about that. No, I, I can say exactly what I said. I said what they will care about is whether we meet the criteria or not. Hearsay from sales reps or even emails, it, none of it came from classic development. And the indication that at the planning commission hearing that um, there was nothing from classic directly on that, it was just vantage and saddle tree. What I said, and I will say it again, I still have not seen anything that was produced from classic homes to that effect. And uh, we will also point out that for classic um, Vantage and Saddle Tree, all contracts include a clause to acknowledge that they um, that the there is no guarantee that the adjacent property will stay in that current zoning. So all residents when signing their contracts sign the contracts with that clause in there. So it clearly indicates there are no guarantees if you've got a vacant parcel next to you that it will be developed for the current zoning as shown or anything that anybody else may have suggested. Um, equivalent lot widths, um, that's why I kind of wanted to go back to the other plans. So if you could go forward a few more slides, please, Debbie, to the one with the lot standards. That one, yeah. So on this slide, um, we can talk a little bit more about equivalent lots. So the, um, as co was correctly noted, the lots are, that you can see on the adjacent filing against Catnap Lane, lots 15 and 16 are both 8,400 square feet. They are wider, they are 70 feet. Well, I, I, I'll qualify that. They are 70 feet wide and they are 120 foot deep. So if you look at lots one through three, where it was suggested that they were much smaller, they are 70 feet wide also, and they are a minimum of 160 feet deep. So they are a lot uh, longer, which gives more scope for retaining trees in the rear. And it also gives more scope for um, having a different uh, lot um, com configuration or home configuration. You can get deeper homes with that additional lot uh, depth. And then if you look at the, the lots that are um, 9 through 12, which are the 60 foot wide lots, uh, first of all, we, we would say we've, put, we've uh, focused those on the side of the cul-de-sac that is away from the existing neighbours. So those lots are not immediately abutting the existing neighbours. And again, those lots are 140 feet deep. So that additional depth, the 60 foot lot lot width does allow a three car garage and the additional lot depth gives more capacity and scope for um, differing um, home sizes. So there's nothing in these lot sizes which would create a, a lot design or development that would not be consistent with what's elsewhere in the community. Regarding the um, impact on the visual appearance of um, Baptist Road, 
if we could uh, move on to the, I think that let's go to the final slide for that. I think that best judge, I wanted an aerial. So the very, that's it. So you can see on this final slide, it's not, not very clear, but I, I do believe you have these on your monitors that um, the, the right of way line is that very dark line. So the edge of our property boundary is the right of way. So within that right of way, there is uh, there are utilities going through there and there are substantial trees within the right of way, which this development is not touching. Then there is a 50 foot buffer, as I noted, that we were continuing through this development, which um, that, so that 50 foot that's at the back of lots 12 through eight is going to the, all those trees are going to stay. So you've got the trees in the right of way, you've got the trees in the 50 foot buffer. And then in the tracks where we've removed the lots adjacent to Sanctuary Rim Drive, you're going to have trees in that area. Plus, there will be trees that will be retained in the rear of the lots because they do not have to be clear cut. So there's still going to be a substantial buffer from the edge of Baptist Road to the rear of any home um, that will be in the region of probably 150 feet and the, and the deeper lots allow for that additional um, uh, buffer at the back of the lots, which are much deeper than some of the lots on the existing filings adjacent. So I just wanted to clarify some of those points and now I'm just gonna flick through my notes to check that um, I covered everything I wanted to cover. And um, I think I did, I just wanted to re reiterate that it's, it's about the criteria that the PD site plan needs to be assessed against, not about what may have been said by a salesperson. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, I guess it would be at this point, Mayor and Trustees. Uh, Lauren Moreland. I'm one of the vice presidents of Classic Homes and I'm the project manager of Sanctuary Point. Um, I've, I've been the project manager since the inception of filing one. Andrea has actually been the land planner from the beginning of the project in 06. So entitlement went through Doug Stemple, our CEO, um, and Joe Lloyd, our president. And then once we're ready to proceed into developing the site is when uh, I took that over. And so um, I'm not only uh, obviously managing this site from the land development or, or home building or ARB side, but I'm also a resident there. And so, um, you know, I personally worked with Andrea and I personally drew the sides to that entrance, the side monuments, the fences, helped with the landscape design. Andrea helped with the entry monument, uh, the bell tower, pulling it out of the old Baptist camp, the food bell. So I know the ins and outs of all of this project. And I think what's tough for me as a resident and as a as the representative of classic homes is i know mayor wilson was here through much of this um mayor pro tem elliott has been part of many of these pd site plan discussions but many of these residents weren't here to see the entitlement process and the years that it took to get these approved and working with the neighbors on a much greater scope so pd site plan one we're working through 255 lots and we have two and a half to five acre lots um Happy Landings to the north, Higby Estates to the north. We had Fox P Pines, Fox Run, and Kingswood. And did we get everything we wanted on the development plan? No, we made concessions. Was it perfect for us? Obviously, we put $70 million of infrastructure into this site. That's a huge risk that we put into it. Um, I know we're classified as the greedy developer, but we've put a lot of risk into developing this. And I would argue that it's the highest quality community, maybe in Monument. And I know we're we're looking at adding between five and six hundred million dollars of, of AB2 monument. And we've done a quality job and really ultimately Triview maintains the streets, the, that's the water, it's the sewer, the parks. Triview maintains everything we're looking at from the monument side. It's really a police presence and they do a great job. We see them up there frequently. So as a resident, I see that and I've lived this. Um, and I lived through the concessions in, in the the tough road to haul to get each one of these PD site plans approved adjacent to the neighbors who had lived there 15, 20, 30 years. The farmers were at each meeting from Kingswood. They've lived in that home 30 years and we still found common ground with them. Were they completely satisfied? No. Were we? No, but we know that that's part of our business, right? That's a person that's been a neighbor of that property forever. And so when we work through that, 
we started out with 15 lots. You got a, you've got a, a uh, range of two to three units to the acres. So that's going to put you at 10 to 15. We started out at 15. The back of the napkin I did originally in 2018 actually showed 16 there, which was slightly over that cap, more 50 foot lots. That was not an official layout. That was me doing this enough to sketch it out, scale it and go, I think we could get 16 here. Obviously that creates a lot of grading, but in reality with the way we've developed that site and I see saddle trees site plans, I see vantages, I see classics. And um, when we grade that right away, that road and cul-de-sac in, whether you're putting six lots and we're going full depth on that cul-de-sac because of the utility requirements for Mountain View, Black Hills Electric, um, the right-of-way width is, is specified in your criteria, you're grading that right-of-way out, whether you're doing eight or you're doing 15, that right, right-of-way is gonna be graded. And so we stayed consistent with the rest of the community because the surrounding neighborhoods wanted that 50-foot buffer, and that's what we did. We kept the 50-foot buffer along Baptist to help protect that entrance. By the time we got done with the first neighborhood meeting, I totally agree that losing the first two lots adjacent to Sanctuary Rim Drive protected that entrance. Um, I'll touch on the on the uh, sewer easement that is on the north boundary of this. And so we had numerous complaints from neighbors on clandestine court in regards to the debris, dirt, down trees um, at the top of that hammerhead on the, I'm going to call it the west end. And so I had my development manager go up there to get that cleaned up. Well, we were pulling breeze out of Forest Lakes as we developed that and those boulders. And so as we were developing that, Mark Sherwood wanted to to go above and beyond as he has on this entire project. And the easement was already tore up from us running the sewer line from clandestine court down to Sanctuary Rim Drive. He dressed that up, he spread breeze that was all in the developer's time and falls into no good deed goes unpunished because now it looks like we're removing a trail that's not on any of the approved plans. And if I was a neighbor there, I would hate to see that go. And the reason we're removing that is because the lot depths when you get further up on the cul-de-sac isn't conducive with a product mix that would squeeze in there. And I know they're worried about comparable size homes. Well, on, on these lots, we've got 40 foot product that can reach 2,800 square feet on the main level, a 70 foot deep product. So we've got product line consistent, very consistent with the surrounding neighbors. Um, I've worked with the civil engineer on making the, um, the grading of, of the lots. And the first design was to create typical, as you may see on your, on your grading plans, A lots, B lots, garden levels, walkouts, transitions. In Sanctuary, we've got drive unders, we've got double walkouts. We try to maintain some of the natural topography. And so we looked at the grading plan and figured out, okay, with a couple of potential drive under garages, we don't have to grade as far back. So actually um, the exhibit that was provided tonight showing the line of disturbance in red is actually shrunk a bit, not dramatically, because we have to grade that full right away width. But I was able to squeeze in some of the grading on lots eight and nine. Um, and so wanted to touch on that. Um, obviously one of the planning commissioners pointed out that a church that wasn't trying to threaten, obviously we have to make this as the landowner financially viable. And I know it's, it's taboo to talk dollars in these settings, but the reality of it is it's zoned for a church and we could move forward with that. Is that a threat? No, I was the one at the start of filing one. I personally had our marketing department put future residential on that map. I'm responsible for that. We never stated future development of six homes or 10 homes or 20 homes, future development, uh, residential development. And that's what we noted on all of our marketing plans. And we as, and I know it, it sounds, um, I don't know, abrasive to say that, you know, the Vantage contract, they provided that to me. And it goes as far as stating that any adjacent land will not be challenged by a Vantage homeowner if it is to, to change zoning and or use. It's actually noted in the Vantage contract. And Mike has sent that to me, one of the owners of Vantage. We don't want to go there. There is some he said, she said, and yes, they were provided an email from um, Dory at Vantage Homes that said that eight to nine range, I believe is what it was, or nine to 10. And so with that stated, um, we as the landowner, as the developer, if we were gonna commit to a, a density number, we would have put that on every marketing map that we've been pu publishing for years. We did not do that uh, because we didn't know at the time. We didn't even go through the formal study. I did the back of, back of the napkin uh, drawing in 18. And so I don't remember when Andrea formally did that. That was 18 or 19. Most of these folks contracted in 17. I don't know if the other um, sales teams were looking at this and going, yeah, it looks about like, you know, Lazy Cat looks like about this many lots. I don't know, but we as the landowner and developer have never committed to a density range. And so, you know, that 10 to 12, we're, right, we're actually just shy of the middle, right? 12 and a half would be consistent with both 
surrounding properties, but filing uh, two and filing one uh, in PD site plan one. Um, I stated I was the developer rep at the second meeting at the classic office that is being noted um, that was being threatening in regards to we could slam eight lots up against yours. The big concern was protecting Baptist initially and protecting the entrance. And I said, I know this is going to sound brash and it's probably going to sound a little bit arrogant, but let's be careful when we're talking about density ranges on how we have this conversation because eight lots in order to protect some of what you're requesting means I can shift all the lots to the north. And I prefaced with how it was going to come across immediately. Um, and so I'll own that comment. I'm not going to try to deny that or dodge it. I'm going to own it wholeheartedly that that's the way I stated that comment in that meeting, 100%. Um, do we want to do that? No. You know, I'm a resident there. want to do a responsible job. I pull on that site every day in and out, probably more than most homeowners, because not only do I live there, I'm checking the site multiple times a day. And so um, I think I've covered all the notes. Um, I had any questions for me? Thank you. At this time, we will uh, close the public hearing portion of this ordinance and we will bring it back to the board for discussions and questions <clears throat> for the planning department or the developer. Look. Five first Press question is about the uh, history of the church. Um, wh when did the, the town get notice that this land was originally going to be set aside for a church? And when did that change? It was in 2006 and the sketch plan was approved for a church site. And when this was brought to us, that's when I knew it was changing. So, so just recently. With this, with the submittal, that's. Unless it happened before I started, this is, just, this is before both of us started. Yeah. So I'm just trying to get some background on. So there was no contract. Obviously, that was the Baptist camp for years, and so in the purchase from the Baptist diocese, we were buying all of that land. That was in 06. I think the the, the purchase agreement started in 05, finalized 06 ish, and so there was conversations of when you're developing this, if you could set aside a parcel, we may eventually want to build the church. And then when we entered into PD site plan one. Um, the gentleman we were working with, with the Baptist church, literally quit following up with us. So we followed up a couple different times. They had no record. There was no agreement signed that the church would go there. We followed up on, we gave them our word that we would set aside land. So we did. And so that came off the table. And so just recently, this. When, whenever PD site plan one was approved is when we reached out to them. And I don't know, was that 14, 15? So it's been six years or so. So six years since you've stopped hearing from the church. And this is the first we're seeing the proposal to put home lot, home sites on where this church was going to go. Correct. And we knew that from meeting with the church. That's why when we released our first filing out there, based on the church not wanting to move forward any longer, we noted future residential on all of the marketing maps because we really felt that this would be a rezone and we could have done this earlier in the project and obviously not fought um, the, the internal fight within sanctuary residents that have been there two, three, four years versus, you know, we could have done this zone change ahead of time, but we elected to wait till the tail end of the project. Okay. If I can move on to the, the picture that's on the screen there right now shows, um, I'm assuming this is a trail that goes from the cul-de-sac where it says tract A, southwesterly down to, I can't tell what these street names are, but it goes all the way through to where it says track C right now. Are, is the trail, that trail being eliminated? Correct. So it's not depicted on the PD site plan, the approved PD site plan. It was not supposed to be a trail. It's a sewer easement for Triview. And it's a sewage what? It's a sewer easement for Triview. So the sewer outfall comes off of clandestine court and then goes through that tract and then connects it uh, sanctuary ring drive. And so that's the one I was talking about. Our development manager elected when we were getting calls for cleanups on clandestine cleaned up the debris up at the hammerhead and he went ahead and dressed up that sewer easement and it looks like any of the other trails out there. But the trail is not actually part of the development. Correct. And it's technically right now, yeah, it's on the easement, but it's still on 
this parcel of land that we own. Okay, and how, how many years has that been in place? Mm, probably three, they, they would know better than me, I'm guessing three years, two and a half. Year and a half, two years, somewhere in that range. They're using it as a trail now. Okay. <clears throat> Um, where th public comment is over. Trustee Romano. Can I follow up on the trail, Mitch? I'm not. Yes, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm, that's oh, okay. okay. So, so the, the mailboxes that are mentioned, that is on the street. So when the one lady mentioned getting the mailboxes, she must come off the cul-de-sac down the trail and access mailboxes that are on the street there or no? We have just down sanctuary room drive from Baptist road. I would call that Northwest there. Wait, why did it leave? <laughs> She's finding you better. Uh, okay. Do we, do we have a pointer that you can highlight when you, I, I can't, yeah, some of these don't have street names. And, yeah. And okay. I, my eyes don't work that well. I can't see these. And I'll well, I suck. To reach the monitor. Okay. So, um, Okay, why, l let me ask this, e e even if you do these homes, why Why would that, quote, trail path, whatever you want to call it, not be able to exist? So the depth of the lots near the cul-de-sac become too shallow. And so, and the more shallow we make that lot line, the closer the homes are going to get to there, the tree clearing. You know, we've got the typical setback. You've already got it cleared for uh, the trail there. And so the upper little skewed on the direction there, but I would call it the northeast end of that, where you hit the bubble, it becomes too shallow for typical product. We typically design for 50 foot wide lots, so it's 40 foot product, and then you've got ranging depths from 50 to 74 feet, 72 feet deep. So it's four is the problem. We could bring back the one with the measurements, please, Debbie. I'm sorry, I didn't bounce you around. Just to let you know where the mailbox is, if you could see my pointer. Yep. That's where the mailboxes are that they walk down from, from this trail. Right here. Oh, and so it's, and then they go to the mailbox over here. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Um, so can you go back to the measured one, please? Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. So you're talking about lot four is 160 and 148 feet deep. Am I seeing that right? Yep. And if you it's a 20 foot, 15 or 20 foot, you're losing that. And you've got a 25 foot setback on the front. What's the rear setback? 20, so you're losing 45 feet. And it's off the short, off that bubble. So even where it clips into three, you're gonna be, that's gonna radius. The garages are always on the high side. And so it's a garage right on lot three. So you'll take that measurement where that lot line curves up. And so you'll start your 25 foot setback from there, we go back 25 feet, and then you have the house footprint. How many feet would, okay, so then what would be, well, the, you're still going to have the easement there though, right? The easement will be there through the backyards and we'll note that on the plat. So future property under, owners understand, and we've got that throughout the site, whether it's water lines. Oh, but that's going to be within their property, not in between, not beyond, behind be their, their fence. It's going to be, be within their, their fence. And it will no tribe you easement, sewer easement. Okay. So then is there, so between like, you know, lot four, not your new lot four, but the prior lot four mm -hmm. over there, the 18,000 square foot lot bordering up to their, you know, two and three. What, what's, what's, what's the, what's between them? I mean, is there anything between them or is there just lot line to lot line? Lot line to lot line. Correct. So that, so whatever that, that's what's going to get rid of that quote path. Correct. Is going straight to lot line. You're correct. And if you did keep a trail there, how many feet would you need to cut off the lot? I'm guessing 15. Minimum would be 15. And some of it's going to be depend on tribe view based on their sewer depth there. So a lot of times they'll increase that width depending on depth so they have room for their spoils. Okay. Um, Mitch, continue. I'm sorry. Oh, you're doing fine. You're picking right up where I was going with it. Now, I, would, I guess I would like to hear if, if there's a product that fits in these lots to the, is that the north, lots one through four? 
is there a product of yours that fits in those lots where you can maintain the existing trail? With the ranch restrictions, it becomes complex that we've offered up. Uh, yes, we have a couple of plans, but you run into redundancy issues. And the other item is they're worried about property values. Uh, as uh, Dr. Uh, Sarah, I, I always mess up your last name. I apologize. Um, she noted saddle tree won't be in there. Advantage won't be in there. The perceived decrease in property value based on a smaller product, right? They don't want the smaller product. They don't want decreased property values. And so do you want to maximize the lot size? Because one of the concerns was they don't like the small lots. It's already with a cup with 184 or a couple 8,400 square foot lots. There's three of those on catnap. And so it's not like we're shrinking those lots. So then it becomes less consistent with what we already have there, even though it's within PRD4 zoning. And so, and I will tell you, we're classic is over a $900,000 price point in filing seven currently. Um, and so if we look at where the average price points were in filings one and two, it's drastically different to this point. And so some of that's hard cost, you know, development costs have gone up dramatically from filing one down to filing eight and nine that we're in right now. But I think it's very consistent with what we've done and it's identical to what's outlined in the, the zoning code. And it, again, it's, it's tough. And I, I appreciate the questions and, and looking out for the citizens, but I mean, as a landowner, we're completely consistent with what's required based on your zoning and development codes. It, it's, it's a hundred percent consistent in my belief. I say a hundred percent is it, 98, 97, I don't know, but I really feel like we meet all criteria there with the current layout. And again, technically on the on the PRD4 and the two to three units of the acre, 15, and we made those adjustments down and lost three lots based on neighbor concerns. I would just like to add and emphasize here and Debbie, you have the cursor there, that we are recognizing the desire to have that connectivity to the mailboxes in the park by keeping that trail track between lots four and five. And then there is a direct route along the sidewalk um, on the cul-de-sac and then going onto the sidewalk and Sanctuary Rim, Rim Drive. So yes, is it a little further? It is, but it is still a, a, a more convenient uh, route to the mailboxes than it would be to go all the way around clandestine court all the way around. So we've tried to honor the um, objective, should we say, of, of that trail and, and keep that trail connectivity and, and the link via the sidewalks. And, and as, as Lauren noted, that trail at the back of those lots was not, not a proposed trail on any of the originally approved plans. No, I'm yielding my time to the ball gentleman on the left. Okay. Um, so staff, that's true. It was never, it was never intended on any development as a trail. Is that correct? Okay. Um, and then you can verify, and I'm assuming that it's right. It sounds right that what they mentioned about contracts and that when you sign one, there's no guarantee for future use of being rezoned, et cetera, Mr. Ritchie. So I, I, I think I can address that. I, I think there's been a, a lot of contract issues raised by both sides here. From the the issue here is that what the uh, planning commission and now the board of trustees is bound by is in fact um, the previously approved density levels. And so what you're what you're bound by there as far as what the board may require is that two to three um, units per acre which would get you um, 11 to 15. And again, 12 have been proposed here. Um, let, me, let me share a couple things. Um, one, I'm not against you having homes there. Uh, two, I've talked to both sides here for a second. I'm not against there being homes there and I'm not holding you to a number that some other developer said you should have. That's just ridiculous, okay? Um, there's obviously enough of a challenge to have been on this side of, 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 of this room, okay, where th this kind of turnout and what I'm hearing, because I have been on that side, isn't made up, okay, as to how these people feel treated. And I don't care whether it's you or anybody else, those other people that wear your name badge represent you, whether they have authority to talk about what the lot is or not, period. And you should own that, okay? Absolutely. Uh, on your side, um, 
though those emails from Vantage and, and um, uh, Saddletree don't really have enforceability to them, we all have emails. They have email. I, I would have encouraged you if I was on your side to send us those emails before this meeting. Okay. Just, oh, I, I didn't get any of them. Okay. Well, no, I mean, to send them to our email, our emails are all on the public website. Uh, you know, to get us as prepared as possible. Because again, I've been out there with neighbors about community issues, talking to a board, feeling very frustrated and banging my head against the wall. Okay. So I, I hear you and I hear you very clearly. Um, except, Jim, except, one second though. Did the emails come into the towns before this meeting? When? I never got it. It was during the neighborhood, after the neighborhood meeting and before the neighborhood. So this is the first we're hearing of this that the neighborhood held a meeting with the developers and nobody on the board was made aware of the, the complaints of the residents that live there. We wouldn't get anything forwarded. I wasn't directed to do so. I, I would have appreciated having those and, and, and then you guys, our citizens, you can send them to us directly. We're, we're your elected representatives. Okay. Um, so it, 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 it seemed to me that um, the trail was never part of a, a, a site plan. It really hard to enforce that. You guys got to understand that. Um, it, it, and I'm, I'm not speaking as the board, I'm speaking as a trustee. Um, as far as the overall comprehensive to the town, it works. Um, it would seem to me that, that, however, there are enough issues here where I don't know if I'm comfortable tonight making a decision on this. I'll tell you that right now. Um, I don't like the way nine through 12 are. They are very narrow and they don't fit with the rest of the community. Uh, beings this does in our own attorney's words, say it fits 11 to 15. I would really recommend 11, not 12, making nine through 12 more in a line with looking like one through four, uh, or one through three, if you will, to be more exact. Um, and then as far as one through four goes, um, they seem to have capitulated with y'all, if I say that, uh, to ranchers, which you prefer than two-story, uh, but then I guess you could keep your trail and have a two-story house. Um, you know, that, that would be another point of negotiation that uh, I don't know what's more important to you, but I really don't like the way nine through 12 are. I don't like the narrow lots compared to everything else. The sizes are the same as what I see up there on like 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, but the 70 foot are a lot more appropriate to the rest of the community. So um, that's my two cents on it, or four or five. With all due respect, Trustee Romanello, if you look at the overall plan and you expand out directly adjacent to this, filing two is what's adjacent to this. We have paired patio homes that are on 5,000 square foot lots directly adjacent to these lots. If you go to filing five, which I believe you were a trustee, as part of that approval, we put 5,000 square foot lots below our 1.3 to $1.5 million half acre lots. We could pull up, uh, it'll be the overall PD site plan one, two, and three. So we've got a few different ones. There's, this shows, um, it shows the paired patios. Sorry about that. So what we have is Lazy Cat here, clandestine court, the hammerhead, and catnap connecting in. It connects into our paired patio product. Right. I, which is higher density. And this is PRD 4A, I believe we called it. And so these were 50 and 60 foot lots that we replatted from our paired product into smaller lots. And then if we go into PD site plan two, that's where we did our Renaissance product, which is a high density product. Um, 35 foot wide product directly adjacent to our model home complex, which is some of the most spectacular lots in the entire community with that di transitional density being adjacent to one another. Again, and it's not, if you go to the north catnap, the lots on the most northern boundary on catnap that back to happy landings, those are all backing to two and a half to five acre lots. 
those are county lots. We're surrounded by county, and then we we annexed this sanctuary point into the town of Monument. But I mean, if we talk transitional density, which is a is a um, hot topic on the county side when we're doing entitlement, you know, how do you go from a five acre to a third or a one? But we have 10, 12, 14,000 square foot lots directly adjacent to two and a half, five. And I think on the Eastern edge of Happy Landings, the guy that has the kids, the dentist that rides the dirt bikes, I think he's got a 10 acre lot there adjacent to these. So if you take that proportionally, this is a heck of a lot closer than what that is. Okay, um, can we get some questions and comments from our uh, virtual board members? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem? I'm not sure if I am comfortable with voting on this tonight. Um, I, I will say though that I understand that if the um, proposed project meets all of the requirements of the comprehensive plan, um, that legally we need to vote. So I'm, I'm a little bit torn right now. Okay. Uh, Can I make a comment, please? Trustee Clark. Yes. I don't see any reason to withhold approval of this site. They do fall within the required guidelines that we have mandated. I don't see that um, that there's anything more that they can concede other than what they have already done. And I think the um, promises of salespeople can't really come into play, but that is something that the uh, other homeowners can uh, develop with attorney uh, counsel possibly. But again, that's not our concern at this point our concern is do they meet with the required legal guidelines and it's my opinion after all of this lengthy discussion that they do okay uh trustee stevens yeah my concern is the uh, expectation that was set of eight to ten um <clears throat> eight to ten properties on there i understand that classic has not published any documentation to that effect and I also understand that Classic cannot be responsible for what Vantage and Saddletree has said. However, what I heard from the comments from the citizens is that Classic also set those expectations. So the question I would have uh, from to those citizens is, do they have any documentation of Classic sales reps that actually set those expectations? And so I'm sorry I'm not there, but uh, essentially that would be my concern. Uh, I do agree that it does meet the requirements of our ordinances. I mean, of our uh, of, of our uh, plan, um, but I don't think it's appropriate to say one thing and then, uh, you know, in order to close a deal. And, and I don't think that. And if it, if it came from Vantage and Saddle Tree, you know, you can't control that. But if it came from a classic rep, then uh, they should be on the same page with uh, with their uh, management and should be able to say exactly what actually is there. So if there's any proof that the owners have of classic uh, having made those commitments, I'd like to know about it. <clears throat> okay, Trustee Anru. Yeah, honestly, very much echoing what Trustee Stevens just said. Um, I do understand uh, the concerns voiced. Um, but again, even as uh, Jesse Clark said, from a legal perspective, um, I also get that. So um, I, there's just a lot to take in, but I, I do understand how they are within their right here. Okay. Did you want to comment on the uh, expectation of eight to 10? I would. I. I've had a consistent sales team up there uh, when we originally rolled the site out for the, the grand unveiling. Um, we weren't sure of what the demand was going to be. We had multiple sales agents up there. One time, um, Jennifer Carlson, Hayden Frazier, Tina Lunkar, Teresa Smith has been up there from day one. She's still there, has sold every filing. Jeff Ellis has been there since filing one. That's been our two consistent uh, sales team members. They said they have never committed to that. They were adamant. I know there's five sides to every truth. 
that sales team has been very consistent with me because we've had a lot of conversations after meeting with the neighbors, what expectations were set. And they, they swear that they have never set that. When I reached out to Vantage, they said, Dory heard it from somebody. She said classic. Well, the only one that could come from is myself. And I didn't even do an analysis until 2018. And that was 16 lots, the first stab I took at this. And so I, I know it's a hard decision. And I know we're battling through the he said, she said. And ultimately, it boils down to as the landowner. And we're presenting an application that is consistent with all applicable codes um, and development plans within the town of monument these aren't fun conversations that's the one part of my job i don't like every every piece of ground we entitle it's these hard conversations with people that have lived there 30 years it's it's not always the case with people that have lived there three or four that didn't see us battle to get their lot that is similar in size maybe not identical similar in size with their neighbors that have been there for a lot of years so i went through this same process just a few years ago and that's where i show a little bit of personal frustration and I probably take it a little more personally as I live there. I've devoted so much time to this community. I fought so many battles to get us on the same page. And I, I was getting texts from one of the Kingswood neighbors today, Connor McCluskey. We've got a great relationship. Now he was at the forefront of trying to work through the issues we had, but we've got a great relationship and we try to work with the community. We're not trying to take down values. We're not trying to overpopulate, overbuild that community. We're trying to do this responsibly. And do I feel like this is responsibly? Absolutely unequivocally, this is responsible. I, and it is a heck of a lot better. It isn't a threat about putting a church there because obviously we're gonna have to gain our capital back in some way, right? And so that could be having the land appraised for a set $12 a foot to a church and you donate that land and then you get that tax back and then a church has it and can build on it. Do we as community members really want that church there? I don't, I drive through that every day, I live there. I don't want a church there. I would much rather look at 12 homes than I would in eight homes, you're grading the same amount of right away. I realize you're spacing the houses. You may save a few more trees, but the 12 homes from where we started, we obviously started at 15. We've worked down. We've made the same and consistent concessions we have with all the neighbors and all the surrounding communities. This is no different. And I know it's hard, but we've done everything by the book. And as a landowner, what more can we do? And I, I get the expectations being poorly set four years ago or five years ago, whatever that was. And I would love to own that. If I had set up improper expectation with the sales teams out there as the manager of that site, I would own that. I owned that the comments I made in the neighborhood meeting. I've got to be transparent. I've been with Classic 26 years. And it's what we do and it's what's built our reputation. We're not trying to blindside people. We're not trying to bait and switch. We've got some of the most fantastic communities from University Park, Flying Horse, Forest Lake Sanctuary. Go through the list. We do it right. And we, we take pride in what we're doing. And I take pride in this. I drew this entryway. I drew those streetlights up there. I've done everything I can to meander the trees to, or meander the sidewalks to save the trees. Town and Monument, Tom Martinez begged me to keep the sidewalk straight because it's easier to plow. It's less work for the guys trying to follow a meandering sidewalk. I meandered that and fought like heck so we could maintain trees down the right of way along Sanctuary Rim Drive. I've done everything I can, and I, I love the free reign that Doug Stemple and Joe Lloyd have given me on this project. I mean, I've got my personal touches all over this, and this 12 lots on this parcel is 10 times more responsible than a church. Thank you. I see some, some, common, some common issues that I think the Planning Commission and the Board of Trustees deal with quite off and on, and that's the salesperson told me this or the salesperson told me that, and we hear that all the time. And the other one being open space. Um, I don't know how often we have been told a trail or, or a piece of property is open space, even though it is owned by somebody else and it's not designated as that it's never been platted as that it doesn't even exist as that. So I've been a victim of it. I'm pretty sure that my realtor planned, um, my salesperson planned my personal property around the train schedule, which was really disappointing to find out. I'm not sure how she did that for, you know, seeing the house, inspecting the house, appraising the house. It was amazing. But I do understand the issues the community has here. I do think that the builder has 
um, gone a very long distance to cooperate and meet up. And I think with the changes that have made that have been made, we are at a point to where nobody is entirely happy. So if is there any other questions from the board? I would like to call the question. Okay, we have a call for the question. Do we have a motion? Can I make the motion? Yes, you can. Great. Um, I'd like to move to, um, where are we? I'm sorry, I lost my place on the. Four A. Four, um, four A. Thank yes. you. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve ordinance number 18 2021 and ordinance approving amendment number four for sanctuary point phase one PD site plan and amendment number one for sanctuary point sketch plan. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Hogan, will you take roll, please? Trustee Unruh? Yes. Trustee Lakind? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. Trustee Stevens? No. Trustee Clark? <laughs> Trustee Clark? Hear me? I can now. Okay, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? No. Mayor Wilson? Yes. That motion passes 5 2. Next item, item 4B, ordinance number 19 2021, an ordinance approving a final plan development site for Wolf Business Park. Ms. Flynn. Good evening, Ordinance 19 2021 Wolf Business Park Lot 2, filing number 2, final PD site plan. It is within Wolf Business Park off of Beacon Light Road. The project is located at 2168 Wolf Court, which is Lot 2 of Wolf Business Park, filing number 2. The development would access off of Wolf Court. It is 1.39 acres in size. The 27 approved Wolf Business Park sketch plan indicates the area to be developed as commercial. The town of Monument will provide water and Monument Sanitation will provide wastewater services for all development within Wolf Business Park. The existing surrounding uses include ABC landscaping to the north, red line pipeline to the south, and peak equipment to the east. The PD site plan indicates a 12,500 square foot spec building used for office warehouse space. The proposed site will include a fenced outdoor storage yard for equipment and materials, required parking, lighting, and landscaping. The lighting will be dark sky compliant. A chain link fence is proposed, which will provide a 98% opaque, opaque slats. The trip generation letter was conducted by LSC Transportation Consultants on March 23rd, 2021. And there was also another traffic report that was conducted in August 2017 for the whole Wolf Business Park. The proposed site will generate minimal vehicles entering and exiting the site. Will be 85 new external vehicle trips on the average weekday. During the morning peak hour, eight vehicles will enter the site and two vehicles will exit the site. During the evening pink hour, two vehicles would enter the site and eight vehicles would exit the site. And the next few slides are the elevations. 
um, these building sites and elevations are similar to peak equipment and red line pipeline that was approved um, last year and the year before. The south and west elevations. And these are the referrals who reviewed and commented on the project. On the planning commission hearing on April 14th, 2021, no one from the public spoke for or against the project and planning commission voted five to zero to recommend approval. The planning commission recommends approval of ordinance 19. 2021, a final PD site plan for Wolf business park lot 2 filing number 2 based on the staff report findings that the proposed development complies with all standards and criteria for approval. And we have Lisa Peterson and Robert green with hammers construction. Who's here tonight to answer any questions you may have. No. Sorry, do we have any questions from the board prior to open the public hearing? I just got one. What kind of business is this? I think we've they've been up here before, right? Okay, just refresh my memory then. <laughs> do you need us to state our name for the record? Lisa Peterson with Hammers Construction. Uh, we do not have a user for this lot yet. We are building it as a spec building currently, but we are targeting uh, subcontractors, uh, commercial, anything for office warehouse mainly. Thanks. Any other questions from the board? Okay, I will open this item up to the public for public hearing. Would anyone like to comment for or against this item? Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody online wishing to comment? Okay, I'll leave the public hearing item open for momentarily while we, while the board discusses. Um, doesn't sound like there's much discussion. Do anybody else have anything to add? Okay, we will close the public hearing portion of this and bring it back to the board for a motion. I move to approve ordinance number 19, 2021 and ordinance approving a final plan development site for Wolf Business Park lot two filing two. Second. Second. We have a motion and some seconds. Ms. Hogan. Trustee Stevens. Yes. Trustee Lekind. Yes. Trustee Unruh. Yes. Trustee Romanello. Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Uh, item 4C, ordinance number 2021, approving final plat development for Monument Dental Clinic. Ms. Flynn? I'm sorry if someone's talking, we can't hear it on oh. over the internet. I'm sorry, I forgot to put my my mic back on. Would you like me to start over? Yes, please. Okay. Yes, start please. Over. I I apologize. Again, this is ordinance 2021. Monument Dental Clinic final PD site plan. It is within Monument Ridge subdivision. 
The site is located at 745 West Baptist Road, which is between the Walgreens and McDonald's. It is within lot three of Monument Ridge. The development's access is off of Sky Vista Point, which is a private frontage road, and it's 0.78 acres in size. The approved Monument Ridge preliminary PD site plan indicates the area to be developed as commercial. Triview Metro District will provide both water and wastewater services for all development within Monument Ridge. The existing uses include Monument Ridge filing number two to the south, with is going to be an orthodontist and family um, pediatric, pediatric dentist, McDonald's to the west, and Walgreens to the east. The PD site plan indicates the site to be 3,200 square feet, a dental clinic, and the name of the dental clinic will more than likely change. The proposed site will include required parking and lighting and landscaping, and the lighting will be dark sky compliant. A transportation, transportation memo was conducted by LSC Transportation Consultants on August 21st, 2020. The proposed dental clinic is projected to generate 123 new external vehicle trips on an average weekday. During the morning peak hour from 6.30 a.m. to 8.30 a.m., nine vehicles will enter the site and three vehicles will exit the site. During the afternoon peak hour from 4.15 to 6.15, four vehicles will enter the site and 10 vehicles will exit the site. And here are some elevations of the proposed Monument Dental Clinic. As I said earlier, the name will more than likely change. These are elevations from the north, the west and the north, and the east to the south. And here are the list of referrals who reviewed and commented on the project. On April 14th, 2021, it was heard before the planning commission. No one from the public spoke for or against the project and the planning commission voted five to zero to recommend approval. The planning commission recommends approval of ordinance 20, 2021, a final PD site plan for Monument Dental Clinic based on the staff report findings that the proposed development complies with all standards and criteria for approval. And the applicants are here today to answer any questions. They're from WMG development. But the applicants have no presentation. No presentation. Okay. Um, any questions from the board for the for planning commission planning department or the applicant? Okay, yeah, I will open it. Wait, I have a quick question. Uh, I'm okay. assuming the name is going to change because this is a different organization than the one that's across the street that's called Monument Dennis. It's a different organization and the applicant's gonna come up right now and speak more on that. Thank okay. you, good evening, Dorinda Marvin for the record and I'm the planning and entitlements director with WMG. Uh, really the, the name on there is a placeholder. Once we're in a community, we like to uh, look at the market, look at the area and, and sort of brand the clinic once we're here. So it's just a placeholder name. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Uh, I have a question. I, I would presume that knowing that there's a dentist office across the street, um, I presume you've done some market research to realize that there is a demand for another dentist office right across the street. Yes, ma'am. We have, and the, uh, as was mentioned, there was 1 that's going to to the rear of this building with a specialty in pediatrics and orthodontics, which would not be our specialty. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I will open it, the public hearing portion. Um, is there anyone in the public that would like to speak for or against this item? Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody online? Okay. Are there any other questions from the board at this time? Yeah, I just have a quick one. Who's responsible for maintaining the road that goes back there behind, uh, behind King Supers and where this uh, place, not King Supers, I'm sorry, uh, McDonald's Walgreens. and Walgreens and all that. There's road back there. Who do you know who are, are the individuals responsible for that? Or is that publicly, <clears throat> is that done through Tribu? So as far as maintenance, they are maintained by the association, by the business association. They are owned by the lot, sort of the roads are split between the lots. So we would own half of the lot within our property but they are maintained by the association. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, I'll close the public comment portion and bring it back to the board for a motion. I make a motion to approve ordinance 20-2021, an ordinance approving a final plan development site plan for Monument Dental Clinic. Second. We have a motion and a second, Ms. Hogan. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Romanella? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Thank Be you. We look forward to being a part of your community. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Before we move on to the res resolution, section i'd like to make a clarification um and mr foreman mr ricci you might want you might have something to add to this but as a quasi-judicial role in ordinances emails to town staff if they are not emailed to us are not privy to us am i correct in that because my understanding as a quasi judicial role, we are to take in what is at the meeting, not outside sources. Uh, that, that is correct. And so I think the issue here is, is the appropriate method of getting that to you either through some sort of public comment. And I, I will have to look deeper into that issue. But public, we don't have a method for remote or, or pre-public comment, we have public comment for at the meeting. That's correct. Okay. If the public is presenting evidence to counter something that has been brought to the attention of the town board or employees, how is it that we should not be able to see in our packet that we get fully made aware of three or four days before a meeting, all of the information? So the planning committee has seen it. It sounds like members of town staff have seen the complaints. And to me, it doesn't seem like there is a, an avenue preventing that information from being brought to our attention prior to this meeting so we can make informed decisions at the time that the applicant uh, has presented their information. And, and uh, I believe that that is something that we will need to, I will personally be looking into um, to determine how we can do that. I agree that there is a concern with the quasi judicial nature of the hearing. And so we need to figure out what method is available, if any, to do that. I believe there probably is a method to make that happen. The question is how and um, on, on what basis. And my concern would be the extent if we have someone showing up to make comment do we also accept their email as an additional comment if even it, if it's the same it contains evidence of communications between the two parties that's relevant to the application i i say you're damn right we should see it in our email in our packet okay I, th uh, I think Mr. Ritchie's what he's saying is we're going to investigate this. We're going to look at this. We're going to get with CML and find out what the ramifications are, what the requirements are for us to do this, and then we'll follow whatever legal guidelines we get from them. How do we represent the citizens if they're uh, communicating to the town and we're not allowed to be knowing about it? Well, we are, and we do that often. It's only in an ordinance, quasi-judicial setting that they are our current standard is they have to appear to make public comment no no i get i get that but so so why would somebody somebody's public comment be in our packet if it wasn't in the setting of a of a hearing i mean why would you have a hearing if they can just email you well no no i understand that but it, the, it seems like the the residents that showed up with their concerns had been communicating with the town about this issue. And 
knowing it was going to be coming before us. They knew it was going to the planning commission. They knew it was coming to the board. Yet any evidence that they had had, we could not see because it was not in our packet. So we're not getting the full picture. We're just hearing things. It's, it's basically hearsay. They're, they're, they were making claims against the applicant mm -hmm. and they had evidence that was supposedly emailed to the town, but we did not have that in our packet. Okay. So, um, Mr. Ricci, we'll look into that further. And if there are no other comments on that, we'll move forward. Okay, item number 5A, resolution 29-2021, uh, issuance of special event permit, Ms. Van Dyke, or Ms. Vanden Hoek. All right, well, good evening, trustees and Mr. Mayor. <laughs> um, today we have a resolution um, for the authorization of this of a special event permit from the Monument Hill Kiwanis to hold the annual 4th of July parade, which this year, because the 4th of July is on a Sunday, they would like to hold on Saturday, July 3rd. Um, the application and information was in your board packet. However, we are here to answer any questions that you may have about this special event. Questions from the board. Uh, I know that many of us are being <clears throat> have gotten questions regarding whether or not the 4th of July parade will take place. Um, I hope with the approval of this resolution, we will get a definite answer. If there are no questions from the board, I'll look for a motion. I make a motion to approve resolution 29 2021. Resolution authorizing the issuance of a special event permit for conducting the annual 4th of July parade. A motion to have a second. Second. Ms. Hogan, will you take roll, please? Trustee Clark? Yes, and I'm really hoping we can have it. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Uh, item number 5B, resolution number 20 or number 30, 2021, uh, a resolution authorizing a special avert event permit for 4th of July Street Fair and Beer Garden. Uh, Ms. Vandenhoek. Is that better? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Again, this is for the 4th of July um, uh, street fair and beer garden that the Trilex Chamber of Commerce will be holding again on the 3rd of July. Um, Terry Hayes is in the audience. If you do have any questions about her uh, application that was in your board packet or any questions about the event specifically. Okay, questions from the board. Um, Ms. Hayes, are you seeing a large amount of interest in participants? I should say vendors. Yes, we're getting um, interest from everybody and we get the calls from the parade too. Um, so I, people are really anxious to get out and have some fun this yeah. summer. And do you feel you'll have the uh, standard number of vendors that you usually see? We are going to try to do this smartly, so we're not going to shove them all together like we normally do. So, so we will have six feet in between each one. So I would, there will be a decrease in okay. the amount of vendors in the street, just trying to make some people feel more comfortable when they come out. Okay. Any other questions, comments from the board or motion? Um, I, I just have a quick one. Okay. Um, it, I, I forget uh, Grace Best parking lot. Um, is that normally just used for parking during the 4th of July parade or is there, are there vendors set up there? If you're looking for a space, you can talk to me later. I'm, I'm just wondering if we could, if we could use that to get with the spacing to get more vendors rather than cut it down. 
to use the six foot space to meet as many vendors as we can. We'll take a look at how many vendors we actually get as an interest. And then another option for us would be we go down Washington Street south north. We could go a little bit south. We're already blocking all of that off anyway. But I figured we're going to wait and just see. I don't think we'll get all 110 back. I can't imagine that. So we'll just be happy with whoever wants to join us that day. I think it's going to be a very exciting event. Um, Mr. Foreman, are we for both of these events? I would ask the chief, but I don't see where he went. He are, been, okay, are we appropriately staffed um, with the police and uh, public works? We are. I've met with um, I met with the chief and with the commander on that. Uh, we also uh, normally use Colorado Rangers. And uh, he is contacting them tomorrow as soon as you approve this, or if you approve this. Okay. And are we also, do we even have an explorer group right now? Uh, no, sir, we don't right now. Okay. Further questions from the board or a motion? I'll move to approve resolution number 30, 2021, a resolution authorizing the issuance of a special event permit for conducting the annual 4th of July Street Fair and Beer Garden. Second. We have a motion and a second. Ms. Hogan? Trustee Romanella? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. A motion passes 7 0. Uh, Item number 5C, resolution 31 2021, a resolution extending and renegotiating the contract for all copy products. Mr. Anderson. Good evening, everyone. This is a nice change. Um, real quick, a uh, little background. We are about three years into a five year contract with all copy. We're going to be um, renewing. A lot of our equipment will be getting some new equipment. We'll be moving around some existing equipment. We'll be bringing on four new devices. Um, we'll be getting rid of a device that was not utilized. So that's part of the recast of the contract. We're going to be moving from roughly uh, $1,966 a month down to $1,916. Uh, so we're going to be saving some money, bringing on some new equipment. Um, all Copy has been a great business partner to the town. We get same day uh, service with technicians when we have problems. We get training uh, from them on how to better utilize our equipment. Uh, we order almost all of our um, ink and supplies through them, saving some money going through uh, Amazon or Staples or those sorts of things. And we make sure we're getting exactly what we need. And they've just been a great business partner. We meet uh, quarterly with them to review our contract, look at overages and they are involved with keeping our costs down. So I have uh, no problem encouraging the board to uh, authorize us to extend the contract another five years. And I can answer any questions if you guys have any. Okay, can you restate, what was that savings again? Uh, it's gonna be about a savings. So we're bringing on four new pieces of equipment and we'll be saving about uh, 50 bucks a month, Mr. Mayor. Okay, this item was a possible item for the uh, consent agenda, except for the concern that it is a five year contract. Does the board have any questions or comments on this resolution? Seeing none, I'll look for a motion. I make a motion to approve resolution 31 2021, a resolution extending and renegotiating a contract with all copy products. Second. We have a motion and a second, Ms. Hogan. Trustee Unruh? Yes. Trustee Romanello? Yes. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. Uh, Item 5D, resolution number 32, 2021, a resolution approving contract with Martin Marietta for capital paving projects. Mr. Tharnish. 
Good evening, Mayor and Board of Trustees. The resolution you have in front of you tonight is to approve a contract to Martin Marietta for the 2021 capital paving projects. Uh, when we review our five year plan based on um, condition of roads and the amount of traffic it puts on them, uh, the roads that were up for paving this year is uh, Woodmore Acres Drive and what was the side street? and uh, Mining Way. Those are two roads that are scheduled uh, that are at the top of our priority list for this year. And we were able to utilize the, um, the contract pricing that Trivia used when they did a majority of their paving or when they did their bid process for that. And by doing that over the years, we've managed to save quite a bit of money uh, by utilizing that and uh, we hope to have uh, a lot of success this year and this is just for the uh, the actual paving projects there will be another resolution um, I don't know how far out it is right now probably a, at least a month and that'll be for some uh, chip seal work which will be done by a different company at that time so I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have on this questions from the board Mr. Foreman, do you want to address this item? Location wise? No, I'm, I'm good. I have no comments. Okay, if there are uh, no questions, I'll look for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve resolution 32 2021, a resolution. Approving a contract with Martin Marietta for the 2021 capital paving project. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Hogan. Trustee Lekind? Yes. Mayor Wilson? Yes. Trustee Stevens? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott? Yes. Trustee Romanella? Yes. Trustee Clark? Yes. Trustee Unruh? Yes. That motion passes 7 0. This takes us back to consent agenda item 3E, resolution number 3421, uh, resolution approving contract with Ratliff Utilities. Mr. Tharnish. Yes, resolution 34 is to approve a contract to Ratliff Utilities for 2021 meter transponder replacement project. This The meter replacement program was one of the 15 major projects that were approved under the COP bond funding uh, late last year. Uh, we happened to come across the uh, advantage to getting this project done now rather than next year because we're always concerned about rising prices in the, in the meter industry. We put this out for bid through an RFP. We had two contractors uh, bid it and Ratliff Utilities was the low response of bidder. Uh, they did send uh, several letters of recommendation from other town managers, uh, several towns in Texas, and uh, they are more than willing to to uh, get this project done in a timely manner. We did give them some dates. I believe the end date for this is in October. And uh, this contract is mainly for the labor portion of the project. And the reason why we do that is because in order to change out people's meter transponders, they normally have to be done in the evenings and on weekends. And for us, that presents a problem for staff to devote the amount of time that we would need to do this. And it, it could put us into a lot of overtime issues because the guys have the normal things to do. And uh, we've been replacing these um, as they fail, uh, several of them a year, a couple dozen a year. But now we have the opportunity to get the remaining 967 residential meters upgraded to this new cellular type of transponder. And like I said in the background paper here, this allows our customers to um, access their actual uh, meter data 
we will give them as we put these in, we give them access through a, a pen code and through a, a website. They can log on and they can see their meter data in real time. It shows them uh, graphs. It can show them um, throughout the night if they want to get up at two in the morning and see if they have water running through their house and pull this up, they could do that. If they get a, a normally high bill, they can review the same data that we look at. And they can see potentially when things are occurring. If it is occurring at 5 a.m., it might be something going on with the irrigation system that they might not be aware of if they're, if they're sleeping. So it's a very useful tool. It's, uh, it's some of the latest technology that's been out there. We just haven't been able to uh, do more of these units because it's such a, um, you have to get permission to get into a house, which again means evenings and weekends. Uh, it has to be an adult there. You know, we're not allowed to come in with anybody under the age of 18. Um, and so we, when we looked at contract out, we were concerned that there, there, there wouldn't be a lot of companies that do this type of work. And so we, we found out there was two. And Ratliff Utilities, again, came in uh, under what we thought we'd end up paying. We thought we'd be in the 75 to 80,000 range. They came in about 67. Oh, where's the debt? 67, 690. Uh, there will be another resolution coming to you at the very next meeting. That will be for the actual purchase of the equipment, the transponders, and what they call endpoints, the, the data machines that have to get hooked up. And that'll be, uh, that'll just be an invoice that comes to you because of the dollar amount. It won't be an actual contract for services. So I'd like uh, to put out if you'd like, if you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Questions from the board. Hearing none, I'll look for a motion. I make a motion to approve resolution 34, 2021, a resolution approving a contract with Ratliff Utilities for the 2021 meter transponder replacement. Second. We have a motion and a second, Ms. Hogan. Trustee Stevens. Yes. Trustee Romanello. Yes. Trustee Unruh. Yes. Trustee Clark. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Elliott. Yes. Mayor Wilson. Yes. Trustee Lekind. Yes. That motion passes 7 0. All right. That takes us to the public comment portion of our meeting. Do we have anyone that would like to make public comment? Mr. Anderson, do we have anybody online? Okay. If we have no one wanting to make public comment, we will move on. Uh, item seven, board authorization items. Uh, Ms. Hogan, draft rules and procedures, June 7th. Um, yes, I'm requesting to see if the board would like to um, set up a workshop where we could discuss uh, setting some rules and procedures in place for continued um, remote participation in board meetings. Um, as you're aware, we, in 2020, we declared a local disaster, state of disaster, and the following um, resolution was what um, set our remote meetings policy that was tied to having that uh, declaration in place. And uh, we rescinded that declaration through the passage of resolution 25, 2021. So it would be prudent if we want to continue with um, doing some fashion of remote meetings that we put some parameters in place and answer some some questions and flesh out some some details with that policy. Okay. Um, does that work for the board June 7th? I, I have uh, something I'd like to say about that. Um, it, it's okay. my it's my understanding that this um, direction from the governor's office is going to continue uh, well into 2022, possibly towards the end of 2022. So I would really uh, think that we would need some kind of remote participation uh, procedures in place. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that we can put it up for discussion. And I assume town staff will be looking into what other communities are doing similar and other organizations. 
we may be an organization that hasn't had this where others have or or different applications. We'll look into it. Okay, we'll consider that. Um, we'll consider that board consent for June seventh. I will be remote, <laughs> but <laughs> I'll be be present and attending. Okay. Okay. Um, do any board members have any other board authorization items? like to present uh, the possibility of discussion on the uh, sanctuary resolution or declaration that we all have been discussing with Langley. But and for what? For the uh, uh, resolution that the young man that came and talked last meeting discussed. I've been having a lot of uh, my constituents calling and asking when we are going to get that on the table to discuss and and vote on the resolution or declaration for sanctuary status um, to protect the town from future or current um, executive orders coming from the state level. I am not aware of what you're referring to. You said mm. sanctuary point? No, not sanctuary points. Either a sanctuary status or a declaration or a resolution that would include language to protect our citizens from uh, further uh, misdirection, possibly from the state or federal levels. We discussed it the last meeting when the gentleman came up and uh, said, is there anything further we can do to protect the town? And you said, uh, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought you said something about an email. No. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Um, so I'd like to put that resolution debate and, or talk on the table for as a board authorization item for us to discuss. Okay, comment from other board members. I, th I believe we discussed with our last resolution avoiding the sanctuary status because we did not have the authority to control some of those um, items. So, and then when we brought it back up for discussion with our last resolution, there was not interest in changing it. Well, I do think we need to address how we're going to respond to some of the issues that uh, uh, that Governor Polis is coming up with. I was going to save this for the board comments, but uh, the first thing I was going to bring up is what happens if he decides to cancel our 4th of July parade? who has the final authority in making that decision. So if he says, no, it's not good and we can't, we're canceling all parades in the state of Colorado, what is our response to those kinds of situations? A good constitutional sheriff. Yes, a good constitutional sheriff would be great. Well, I, I'm, I'm not inviting the governor anyway, are we? Um, so I then. have I have it on good authority that the governor is planning on on canceling many many things and doing a lot of other things that we are we should be well prepared for. I have submitted uh, some language to several of the members of the board and and to the town attorney for consideration, and I'm hoping we can discuss that ra rather quickly. Okay, when would the when would board members suggest discussing this? Well, we, well, is this going to be a separate, is this going to be during a meeting or are we talking about a separate type? It would need to be a, during a meeting. Okay. Um, I'm, or a workshop. Yeah. Okay. I thought you meant just a workshop or during a meeting. That's what I'm trying to clarify. Cause we have the, the home rule thing coming up and now we just assigned something for June 7th. Mm -hmm. Um, so 
I think we're workshop for the next two meetings out. Unless this was during a meeting, we might need to go. I don't know. Uh, any idea of the next two meeting agendas, Mr. Foreman? So I would, what's on the agenda outside of the workshop? Or do we have an idea, not directly what's on? Trustee Clark, could you send me what draft language you have? Because I have not seen it. I will. I, I actually would like to suggest that it goes to Ms. Hogan and then Ms. Hogan distributes it because uh, I haven't seen it either. And I don't know who else has not seen it. I, uh, I, 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 I was told to send it over to the town attorney and he would distribute or somebody. Oh, okay. I'll wait till I, I get it then. And I did. I'm not going to be at, I cannot be at the next meeting like at all. I'm going to be on a plane during the meeting. So I'd prefer it not be May 17th. So then let's let's shoot for during the meeting, not the workshop for the June 5th meeting, June 7th meeting. Does that work with everyone? Yes. Yes. Mr. Ricci, will you disperse that um, information? Yes. Okay. Are there any other uh, board authorization items? Okay, I have uh, two I would like to address. The first one being I got an email from Colorado Neighborhoods Re uh, Coalition in regards to redistricting. As we know, Colorado, the state of Colorado is uh, currently going through redistricting after the last uh, last census. It is there's an independent congressional redistricting committee and the concern has come up of splitting El Paso County into different uh, congressional districts and even um, even maybe beyond that they have requested that we send a board a letter from the board in support of keeping El Paso County together one of the main premises or one of the main hopes of redistricting has always been keeping communities together and not dividing them. Um, we do a lot of work with El Paso County, our commissioners, PPACG, and all these groups. So with the board's authorization, I would like to go ahead and put, I can send you guys a sample letter and have staff put together a letter from the board uh, requesting that the Independent redistricting commission considers keeping El Paso County whole. Yes, I agree. Yes. Okay, Miss Hogan, will you distribute that uh, that generic letter, and then I will get with town staff and to make it our own. The other item is a public outreach. In the past. Uh, the fire department and um, our police department did, I don't know if board members saw it, but they did short little videos called Chiefly Speaking. The idea has come up that maybe as a board and in our efforts for staff and board members to get more information out the to the community that we approach something uh, similar, uh, kind of mixed with other events, but uh, Madeline, can you give us a little information on how Chiefly Speaking worked out for the police and fire? Yeah, so last summer we created, I think it was four videos around, and they called it Chiefly Speaking. It was our police chief and the fire chief um, just reaching out to the community, doing some education. We used those on our YouTube channel that then we shared on our social media. 
and video content is um, is kind of preferenced in social media. So the the algorithms really show favoritism to those videos because people are are likely to engage in those better. So we we had some good interaction with them. And we would like to try to increase our video content on our website and our social media as an outreach and way to engage with our um, residents. So we were thinking that another series like that would be positive in our community. And we have, this is just kind of investigating. We don't really have any cost or anything yet. Roughly between three and 10,000 is some of the quotes that we've gotten so far um, without a lot of detail behind them. Okay. I think this is a, a good idea for hot topics in our community and how things work. Um, I think there would be, uh, in some ways, board members, any board member who wanted to be involved could be involved, and we could also have community members and possibly sponsorships involved. Um, is the board okay with moving forward on this bid process? Is there any other board authorization items or questions? Okay, that takes us to Board of Trustees comments. Um, Trustee Stevens, did you want to elaborate any more and have anything to add to your previous comment? No, I just think we, I think we're going to have that uh, meeting on June 7th, or uh, we'll have a discussion item on June 7th. I think we need to be prepared for a response if the governor decides to uh, say that we can't have our parade or something like that. <clears throat> he wouldn't change the rules whenever, would he? <laughs> Any other board of trustee comments? Seeing none, is there anything else we missed? I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All in favor? Aye. 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 We are adjourned.